This is Larry Jordan, the host of the Digital Production Buzz. The following interview is an excerpt from a recent program. To hear the entire program, visit digitalproductionbuzz.com. Peter Hamilton is a senior marketing and distribution consultant who works with the nonfiction industry on marketing and business development. He's a former CBS executive. And his, his clients include a and &E Networks, the BBC, National Geographic, and many other media groups, governments, and nonprofits. Hello, Peter. Welcome back. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for ha thanks very much for having me. <laughs> well, you know, it's always a delight having you on the show. And and recently, you hosted a panel at the Real Screen Summit. What was your panel about? Uh, I did. The panel was uh, titled Formula for a Hit, and the content related to how networks use audience research uh, to develop programs and what is the role of the audience researcher in the program development and renewal process. So what was the takeaway from the panel? What, what did people learn? Um, it was a really fascinating panel. We had on representatives from, from Scripps Networks, which is, uh, includes HGTV and Food and other, uh, and, um, and, and other channels, and they've had relatively steady uh, performance of uh, viewing over the last, uh, uh, the last year or so, whereas most of the other unscripted networks have been suffering a decline in viewing. Anyway, for, uh, for the Scripps Networks, they reported that it's very much about the story, that they don't use research heavily to uh, test and to develop uh, pro uh, programs. It's really more about the programmer's gut. Um, the other networks, Nat Geo, Scripps, and Discovery, uh, all rely you know, heavily as well on their audience research teams but really as filters in the development process and not as, as real deciders. And I guess the final takeaway is that there's just so much talk about these new online strategies for, uh, for measuring content and how much they're going to appeal to, to viewers. And all of the research has reported that although they're a really important part of the process, they're not the deciders and that there's no magic wand or silver bullet coming out of Silicon Valley that is going to predict whether a show is going to hit or not. We've been looking for that magic bullet for the better part of 150 years. Yes, and uh, all the they don't seem the to world. feel that they're any closer to it, although they do have a wonderful array of tools to, um, uh, to, to test programs. I, I just, uh, you know, one point that came out really strongly is that the research is more helpful when it comes to renewal time as distinct from developing a new programming concept. It's always easy to find something that doesn't work once you've seen it. It's Im almost impossible to predict something that doesn't work when nobody's had a chance to see it, it seems to me. Would you agree? Yeah, luckily I don't have to make those risky decisions <laughs> day in, day out, but I do agree with you. What, uh, what was or is the Real Screen Summit? The, the Real Screen Summit is a phenomenally successful conference dedicated to um, factual or unscripted or documentary programming. It was launched by a Canadian company called Brunico in 1999 when about 500 delegates turned up. And at the time, they were mainly focused on documentaries and factual series, wildlife, history, science, and those genres. Uh, but with the explosion of reality TV in the um, earlier on this century, the market itself exploded, and it became the key marketplace for the understanding and pitching of ideas in this reality TV area. And I mentioned that in 1999 they had about 500 delegates. There were 2,500 delegates in Washington last week, and each of them paid around about $1,500 plus whatever it costs to uh, for accommodation and travel and the rest. So it's a really big, successful venture. And then finally it's uh, been franchised out to L.A. and London where there are other real screen conferences. 
All right. Well, let's shift gears because one of the things that you spend a lot of time paying attention to is distribution. And let's uh, think about international distribution. You've spent a lot of time in South Africa working with an association called ATFT. What was your trip about? And tell me about the organization. Well, thanks. It's a, it's a fascinating and uh, it's been a wonderful experience for me. I was engaged by the Association for Transformation in Film and Television. It's a South African professional group that's dedicated towards empowering uh, young, uh, mainly young producers who are either black or Indian. They are members of the overwhelming majority of population, which was, of course, incredibly disfranchised under apartheid. The ATFT have engaged me to work with these uh, producers to prepare them to enter the international marketplace. And that means going to South Africa, which I did three times last year, and uh, it's a fantastic country, and um, I really recommend anybody who has the ability to put it higher on their list of, um, of uh, wish destinations. So I went down there three times, and I organized workshops in and presented workshops actually the ATFT organized them. I arrived, presented the workshops in Johannesburg, Durban, and Cape Town, and then uh, met the producers who were going to these big international conferences and markets, whether it was the Science Producers Congress in Hong Kong or Sunny Side of the Dock in France, and I mentored them. It's probably the best use of the word, uh, but really enjoyed their company enormously at these markets. Fantastic what, experience. What, uh, what, what are they doing that, that you think is the most important aspect of their work? Well, you know, it's an incredible country to be in because it's youthful and it's positive. And, of course, it's, you know, the countryside, the landscape is, is, is staggering. And these, and, and also it's, it's got the feeling that even though it's a po politically very, very challenged and the, there are still tremendous divisions between communities, yeah. there's a feeling of optimism and newness in South Africa. And I found, I'm finding the producers there just really open to learn, really open to contribute, and yet full of confidence that... Um, they can make it on the biggest stage. Is there something we can do here to help the guys at uh, ATFT? Um, I think watch this space. Read my newsletter, documentarytelevision.com, where I will be reporting on and tracking developments down there. I'm trying to organize a internship program for young South Africans uh, from the ATFT um, family in the states, but I'm not, you know, not ready to actually press the press the starter motor on that. But we're getting close to it. Um, I want South Africa to be a big part, and this particular program to be a big part of my life because it really gives me a lot back. And uh, so that's that's really the secret. I guess there's one other thing I should mention, and that is that the South African government is ultimately funding this initiative. And there are very significant wow. resources and tax benefits available to producers who shoot in South Africa, who hire crew down there, uh, and who develop intellectual properties in South Africa. So I strongly recommend that um, your listeners who are looking for uh, locations for either their scripted or unscripted work uh, check out the benefits of South Africa. <coughs> Yeah, I want to remind everybody that uh, the HBO series Homeland is filmed in South Africa primarily because yeah. of the tax credits. Yeah, so the same relies to my category of television, which is factual or unscripted. All right, we've got a whole list of subjects I want to cover with you. Going to a different subject, ratings are generating a lot of news recently. What's new on the ratings front? Um. There's been a very significant falling off of viewing of the major unscripted or reality programming channels. 
In some cases, the fall-off is very severe, as in A&E Network. In, with most of the other channels, it's been troubling. I mean, holding water, uh, holding ground is considered to be a, a real accomplishment. And the question is, why? Why is there this, you know, sudden, fairly, you know, universal cross-genre falling away of viewing? And that's what we've been looking at. So I'm not inside the network, so I don't have the, the, the data that they have, but clearly that there is viewer exhaustion with the reality genre. Mm -hmm. The structure of these programs is becoming predictable. Uh, the formats are, are, are known to the viewers. When they ask themselves the question, what's coming next, they pretty well have the answers so they're not sticking around. So I think there's a certain exhaustion of the genres that nearly all of these networks are flooded to with this, you know, reality me tooism over the last 10 years or so. So that's a, an important factor. But another really big factor is that the structural changes in the industry are finally catching up with cable and satellite. And there is a significant, but still at this stage small, but st statistically significant uh, group of viewers who are switching from cable and satellite viewing to SVOD or subscription video on demand, which principally means Netflix, Hulu, and um, Amazon Prime at this stage. Yeah, I'm in the but middle of trying to talk my Netflix. family into that. And these viewers are draining, they're draining, these decisions are draining viewers from the cable satellite ecosystem, and more importantly and scarily, they're draining money, they're draining uh, finance, uh, uh, cash flow, financial flows out of the system. Uh, because, as you know, a Netflix subscription is under $10, whereas I'm paying $125 for my cable and satellite. Uh, package here in Brooklyn, that's a huge falling away of revenues around the margin at this stage, but growing, and anybody who's uh, looking at the model is very concerned right now. Well, are you considering cutting the cable? Um, I, I'm addicted to the English Premier League, and I don't <laughs> have another way of, of getting to it, but other than that, I, you know, I would. But, you know, it's, my choice is pretty irrelevant. I'm over 60, but my son, who is in his 20s, is, is not a cable subscriber, and neither are, are just so many in his generation, and that's a really significant um, yeah. factor. Peter, before we run out of time, your main area of interest is distribution, marketing and distribution and helping program creators create money for their programs. And you've recently published a buyer's guide where you profile hundreds of buyers in dozens of countries and networks. What's changed in the last year for the documentary side of the business? Yeah. Oh, it's a really good question, and thanks for mentioning my guide, which uh, listeners can read about on my website. It's co-produced co with a French um, conference organizer, Sunny Side of the Dock. So what has changed is that I've... Uh, what we're sensing, but we can't quite pin it down, is that with the exhaustion of viewers for these over-formatted and predictable and, and over-managed reality formats, that there is a new look being taken at ways of telling uh, content-rich, um, more factual documentary programs and series that there is a swing back to these in the in the states, or a, or at least focus on how to renew the genre in the states, and at the same time, in Europe and in, in particularly in France and Germany, but also Netherlands and and um, the UK, the documentary unscripted, you know, the more content-rich genre is still you know very strong. So lots of you, lots of producers are looking to do co-productions in Europe, 
for their programs where there is still st- a strong audience and 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 very robust government financing programs. So it sounds like the market for documentaries is stronger internationally than it is domestically. It is, definitely. Uh, the strongest markets would be Germany, France, and the UK. To a lesser extent, Japan. Australia would be shrinking. The States is struggling, but as I said, you know, hopefully a, a return of some kind. Uh, Canada is fairly stagnant right now. There is a uh, the CBC has been defunded by the Conservative government up, uh, up there, and they were an important buyer of docs. So you're really looking at France, uh, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, the UK, and then other smaller markets in Northern Europe, Scandinavia, yes, you need and so inter- on. You need international stories. You can't do American stories if you're going to be doing, uh, if you want to go international, right? Which, wait, what, which is, we're running which, out of time. Which, what, really quickly, because we are going to run out of time, what genre is the hot genre? What, what subjects do we need to think about? Rock and roll. Uh, listen, I don't have, really don't have the answers. I would say to listeners, go to one of these big international markets and find out. You've just got to, you know, got to get out of Dodge and find out for yourselves. <laughs> well, you, you did that blog qu- quickly on Independent Lens, and Muscle Shoals was the uh, was the big uh, the big ratings winner for uh, for Independent Lens. So, rock and roll, people. And Peter, what website can people go that want to learn more about your report? Uh, well, uh, my weekly uh, newsletter is called documentarytelevision.com. And that's and all we welcome one, readers. That's all one word, documentarytelevision.com. Peter Hamilton is the founder of the website and editor of documentarytelevision.com. Peter, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's my honor. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.